Uh, greetings, my name is Lucas Mann, and I come out here this evening to bring to you the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, to share with you the message of life, because Jesus Christ said that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. And friends, the Bible says that man is by default lost by his own birth. He is born into a state of sin, a state of utter depravity and hatred for God. But God sent His Son into the world to save sinners, to save sinners who could not save themselves. For by the works of the law, no flesh is justified in God's sight, but it is salvation by grace, grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. That is the salvation I seek to proclaim this evening. Not a salvation from hardship in life or financial calamity or health afflictions, but rather salvation from sin. See, Jesus came to save us from sin. Don't be deceived by the prosperity gospel, which proclaims a gospel of prosperity in this life, of worldly material pleasures. Rather, believe the true gospel, which says that Jesus came to save us from the power of sin in our own lives and the penalty of sin, which is hell. See, heaven's gates are open wide to those who will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles told the Philippian jailer in Acts 16.31, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And we know from the historical record in Acts that that man fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith. And friends, that's what I plead with you this evening to do. See, I bring message, a message which is a good message. It is the good news. The Greek word is euangelion, good tidings. But friends, I also come to warn, to warn you that if you continue on in your sin and in your rebellion against God, if you continue on the way that you are, the way that you are by birth, that you will be lost forever that you will go to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, friends, if I really believe the Bible, if I really believe that the Bible says that many will go to destruction, then I'm obligated to share with you that news, to warn you, and then to bring to you the good news of Jesus Christ, that He bore the wrath of God upon His own shoulders, upon the cross, that He was slain as the Lamb of God on behalf of His people, that He was raised on the third day. I'm obligated to tell you that. Perhaps you're angry or upset that I would stand out here this evening to preach to you this, that I'm perhaps bigoted or narrow-minded or rude or disrespectful. But friends, think about it. If I really believe this, if I really believe the Bible, I have to do this. I have to share with you this message. The Apostle said, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, sir, I have a job. I work full time. But I want to come out here right after work because I care for you. I could do a lot with my Friday night friends. I could be out partying. Or I could just be at home with my family. I could just be at home with my family. But I do care for you. I really do. I don't want you to be lost. I don't want you to, to go to hell in your sins. I want you to go to heaven with me and with all of God's people. What do you have to do to go to hell? Do nothing. Continue as you are. But it's interesting. God's standard for entrance into heaven is perfection. Something you nor I can do. And so the only way that we can be made perfect in the eyes of God is if we are wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, we have to have a substitute. We have to have someone who stands in our place. We have to have someone who gives us their righteousness so that God sees us as perfect. Don't view God, my friends, as a, as a, a grandfather in the sky, as it were, with a big long beard who is dispensing blessing upon everyone. It doesn't matter how they live. God is holy. What does the book of Deuteronomy tell us? Uh, Moses tells the Israelites, he says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God is certainly holy. Scripture says He dwells in light unapproachable. 
That is, He is so bright in the radiance of His glory and in the perfection of His being that we as sinful human beings cannot dare approach Him. What does Scripture say? It says even the angels are unclean in His sight. The angels, which are also called in Scripture holy, which are also sinless, yet Scripture says that God sees them as unclean in His sight. His standard is so high we cannot fathom it. And so we must have the righteousness of God Himself imputed to us. And that's a word that you may not have ever heard in your life. The word impute means to credit to. To credit to one's account. See, God must view you in order for you to enter into heaven. God must look at you as wrapped in the righteousness of God. As credited with the very righteousness of God. And that is accomplished by Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That is Christ, the perfect God-man, who knew not any sin. That is, not that He was ignorant of sin, but that He Himself had never broken God's law. He became sin for us. That is, He bore the sins of His people. He was treated by the Father as if a sinner... And then look at what the next, uh, next part of the verse says. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So Jesus upon the cross is treated by God as a sinner. As if He was a sinner. Though He in fact was innocent. And then what does God do? He turns right around and treats the Christian as if He lived Jesus' life of perfect obedience. Of perfect submission to the will of God. We know in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 3, that the Father speaks audibly from heaven at the baptism of Jesus. He says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Can God say such a thing of any of us? No. And that is precisely why we must have the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to our own hearts by faith. Faith alone. Sola fide. Not by works of the law, my friends. And so that's what I want to make known this evening. I want to make it known with simplicity. I'm not here to impress. I'm here to rather share this message, this message which is simple yet profound, which is clear yet it could fill an entire lifetime just meditating upon its glories. And so, friends, in light of the work of Christ, if you want to have a part with Christ, if you want to partake of these benefits that Christ offers, you must repent and believe the Gospel. Abandon self. Abandon sin and come to the Savior. Jesus said, Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My Savior is a gracious Savior. And He promises to receive everyone who comes unto Him. See, we don't clean ourselves up and then approach the Lord Christ. God bless you, sir. Rather, we come to Christ that we ourselves might be cleansed by His precious blood. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you washed your garments white that you might partake of the inheritance of eternal life in heaven? Now friends, this evening I would like to cover a specific topic found in a specific verse. It's in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 in verse 17. And here the Apostle Paul is writing about Abraham, who was an Old Testament figure. A man who loved God, who followed after God. Who believed God. And he wrote this about Abraham. I'll actually start in verse 16 since that's the beginning of the sentence. He says, For this reason it is by faith, that is salvation, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be granted, oh, excuse me, guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And then this is verse 17. As it is written, 
a father of many nations, I have made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. What this verse is talking about is the character of God who God is. And this God, the God who is spoken of in this verse, is the one in whom we are to place our trust. We are to place our faith, our confidence. God commands us to do so, friends. The warrant, our right to place our faith in God, is granted to us by God Himself. For He bids us to come, to approach Him in faith. And what is faith? The Bible defines faith for us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In fact, the Greek word for faith is pistis. Pistis. Which is derived from a Greek word that means to persuade. To persuade. See, God grants us the ability, when we have faith in Him, to be persuaded of His existence, His, the reality of the Gospel. The power of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's faith. And then the grace to actually live in accordance with that. See, people can say all day that they believe the gospel. But to live, to live a changed life as a result of the work of Jesus Christ, that is a miracle. See, God does work miracles every day, friends. It is true. And I admit that people are not being raised daily. Or many healings aren't happening like they did in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ while He was here on earth. But God is working a miracle in people's hearts all the time. And it is the miracle of the new birth. Friends, Jesus said you must be born a second time. You've been born one time already. But you must be born a second time. Spiritually. You must be born again. And it is only produced by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is only produced by the power of the Holy Spirit. When Nicodemus asked Jesus how one is to be born again, Jesus said that the wind blows where it wishes and we hear the sound of it. But we do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It is a sovereign work of God in the hearts of men. And my friends, I stand as a living testimony to that reality. That God has taken out the heart of stone that was once in me and has given me a heart of flesh. He has given me a heart that actually desires to obey, desires to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. Which is my chief end. It is the chief end of man to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We are made for God. We are made to enjoy and to worship God. We are created to worship God. But because of sin, the image of God in man has been corrupted, has been shattered. And now man no longer worships God, but rather himself. And his carnal passions and fleshly lusts. Do you have a question, sir? No, just celebrating carnal passion. And so, friends, God Himself, as I mentioned, is the warrant of faith. In other words, because God has said we can have faith in Him, that we have that charge from Him, we have the right to approach Him. We have the right to come to Him in faith. He has invited sinners, one and all, no qualifications, no preparation, rather just the invitation to come and to receive the gift of eternal life. And this verse in Romans 1.17, this verse highlights the character of God, which is so important. That's what our faith hinges upon. I mean, if you believe, if you're going to bet your entire eternity off of the Word of God, then it's clear that you believe that God is a God who tells the truth, who is Himself truth. We know that the book of Hebrews says it is impossible for God to lie. We know uh, that John 14.6 says Jesus Himself is truth. And this verse highlights the fact that Abraham, who was a man of faith, believed God. Why? Because God by His own character is believable. 
God by His own character is trustworthy, is worthy of our trust, is worthy of our obedience unto Him. And so that's what I want to point out this evening to you. And as I mentioned the context, Paul is talking about Abraham. And that's important to keep that in mind. We don't want to ever forget, whenever we read the Bible, what the context is. Otherwise, we'll misinterpret the Scriptures. And so with that said, let's consider the beginning of verse 17. He says, Paul's quoting out of the Old Testament here. He says, As it is written, A father of many nations, I have made you. This is God speaking to Abraham. And it's interesting, he says, A father of many nations, I have made you. And when God spoke that to Abraham, Abraham didn't have many descendants. He didn't have many, many grandchildren, and their children didn't have many children, and so on and so forth. The promise was yet to be fulfilled, yet God says in the past tense, A father of many nations, I have made you. The promises of God are so sure and so powerful, so potent, so strong and secure that God speaks of them as if those things have already come to pass. So it is for me, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for my sin, and that I will go to heaven when I pass from this life. And it is so sure, I can speak of it as if it has already happened as it were. Because God's Word never fails. And then he says, In the presence of Him whom He believed, even God. Now I want you to know, he highlights two things about God here. He says, Who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Two things you and I cannot do. We cannot raise the dead. Friends, there are many people throughout history who have claimed to raise the dead and even people today who claim to raise the dead cult leaders claim to raise the dead religious figures like Jesus Christ throughout history God bless you sir have claimed to raise the dead but only Jesus Christ sir what was that well one he rose himself up from the dead well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were... Well, can I finish what I was going to say? No. Yes, sir. But I'll make this point for everyone. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that there were 500 people who witnessed Jesus' resurrection. And it's interesting, he notes there in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, most of those people are still alive today. What's interesting is that Paul's readers could have easily verified what he said. Because he says, listen, go ask the people yourself. If you don't believe what I'm writing, go ask them. Most of them are still alive. And we know that Paul's writings have been established as truth. They've been held by Christians in high esteem because he was not proven wrong in what he said. What he wrote was historical fact, that Jesus really did raise from the dead. The tomb has been empty for the past 2,000 years. And that is the power of God made manifest, that God can raise the dead, and that He does raise the dead. And as I mentioned earlier, God working miracles today, He raises the dead even today. So spiritually dead. Oh, God bless you, sir. Thank you. See, my friends, because if you are outside of Christ, by, the Bible says that you are spiritually dead. I know that when I was not a Christian, before I was born again, that I was spiritually dead. I was blinded to the truth. But then when I was saved, that is being raised to life. We know from um, Ephesians chapter 2 that that is what salvation is. God raises a dead sinner up to spiritual life. And God does that all the time today. I've seen it in the lives of other people. And I've seen it at work in my own life. And so that's reason enough to believe God. But then Paul outlines the next part. And calls into being that which does not exist. God created this world ex nihilo, out of nothing. He spoke and the worlds were made. He spoke and the stars arranged themselves in the cosmos. He spoke and the waters were formed. He spoke and the land became dry. 
He spoke and animals were created. And then even man himself was constituted as a living being. It's yeah. true. No, it's not. It is true. Odin built the world out of the skull of the dead father. What was that, sir? Odin and the other gods built the world out of the dead father's skull. Well, that's not true. All the gods of the peoples are idols, the Bible says. No, they're not. They're, they're idols. They're Bahala. figments of people's imagination. They live in Valhalla. How dare you call my gods a figment? They are. They're a figment of the imagination. Well, yours, then. No, he's the true God. Bullshit. He says himself Bullshit. to be the true God. He is. He created the world and all things in it. Your God's fake. What's that, sir? If you're going to call my God's fake, I'll call your God fake. Well, you have the right to do that. Yeah, I do. Because That's right. He's not going to do anything about it because he's not real. He is real, sir. That's why you have to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can be reconciled to him. No, I believe in my Lord Odin so that I might go to Valhalla. But that's not true. It's a lie. Yes, it is. It's not. It's a false Prove worldview. Disprove me. Because God says it's true. Oh, you can't say one God said another God's disproved. Why not? Why can't Why can't I assume the Bible's true from the starting point? Because then I can say that the gods of Valhalla claim that all your gods are false and just servants of the frost giants. That's right. You can say that, but it's not true. It is true. Because Jesus Christ is a true God. No, he's not. He said it. No, he's not. No, so he's a liar. True God. Jesus was simply an avatar of the true God. So he's a liar. Yeah. Okay then, so we disagree on that point. But now I'm out here to share the gospel with all these other people and you, sir. And you're welcome to listen. You're welcome to continue I'm on. Listening. It's cheaper than cable. Indeed. Yes, sir. Indeed. And I'll agree to disagree with you. And I bless God that we live in a nation. And I will keep informing those around of the inconsistencies with your word. Is that so right with you? Oh, you're more than welcome to, but I can assure you there are no inconsistencies. Well, holla versus heaven. Let's go. Well, now, what inconsistencies would you find in the Bible? Um, let's see. Rabbits chewing the cud. They don't. They eat their poop. But to ancient man, that would appear like they were chewing the cud. It registers bats as birds, but bats are obviously mammals. Any person with a scientific brain, obviously an infallible creator, would have known that. Now, hang on, hang on. We'll stop one at a time. Thank you. Now, we'll take one at a time. So, let me let me say this. You say, you're saying that my worldview is inconsistent, right? Yes. Do you believe that in order for me to have a valid worldview, it must be consistent? I think that if you're going to claim that that book is infallible and unlying and its creator created the world, you should at least have known what he created. Yeah, but I'm asking you, do where do you get, where do you, uh, what do you stand upon as your basis for saying that I must be consistent in my worldview? I know I must be consistent. Because you stood up there five minutes ago and claimed that your God doesn't lie. He's incapable of lying. So why did he tell me bats are birds? Well, I'll get to that. But let me ask you this. Do you believe in the law of non-contradiction, which is what I was just referencing? Uh, explain it. The law of non-contradiction, that is, in order for something to be valid, it, it cannot contradict itself. So my worldview, in order for it to be valid, must not contradict itself. Okay. So, do you believe that? Sounds good to me. Are you an atheist? No. What are you? I'm a polytheist. Polytheist, okay. So, on, according to your worldview, you believe that in anything in order to be valid must be non-contradictory, correct? What was that? Particularly in a um, multi-deistic pantheon, you can't have contradictions. That's why you have different gods. Well, then why are you requiring of me and my worldview to be because consistent? you said it yourself, that your God does not lie. He is incapable of lying. And it's I'm true. And I'm pointing out lies in his infallible text. I'm saying, you may, I'm saying that you may have misread or misunderstood the text. Okay, so... Rabbits, it doesn't say rabbits shoot the blood? Uh, I have to look at... I don't know the exact reference you're speaking okay, of. For you. Give me a second. All right, yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, we are. Now, I'm, I'm going to... He said my gods aren't real, so I said it told him his gods aren't real. What makes your god better than Allah or any... Well, his god is Allah. He's got... His, his god is Allah. No, no, he's not Allah. Yeah, he's he is. Allah. He's the god of Abraham. No, he's the god of Abraham, Allah. Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, the, Allah is the god of Jacob. That's not true. It is. That's a, that's a fundamental difference in my worldview versus the Muslim worldview. No, they believe was simply another prophet, not the Son of God. But that's not true. They track their lineage back to Abraham. Yeah, they don't believe that Jesus is deity, though. And that's... No, they don't. But that's the same as the Jews. But the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims all have the same God. That's untrue. They all track it back to Abraham. So what? Did Abraham have two gods? No, they're just, they're, their history is false. They, it's a false history. So they don't worship the same God as Abraham, even though they say they do. Precisely. Yeah, they say they do. They claim to, but the claim is false. The claim is false. It's true. 
It is true. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man can come unto the Father except through me. And that is objectively true. Do you think the Jewish God is fake? The Jewish God? Yeah. Now, what do you mean? Are you, are you talking about Yahweh. Yeah. Yahweh? No, I believe in Yahweh. He is the one true God. No, I do not. I do not. He is not. He is. He is not, sir. Sir, that's why, that's why we're totally separate religions. Christians and Muslims, that's why we're totally separate. Now, friends, he may, he may have a problem with me starting as the Bible, uh, starting with the Bible as my uh, basis for my worldview, but that is a consistent worldview. In fact, there is no neutrality when it comes to a worldview. There's no neutrality. There's no starting point outside of the Christian worldview. You either start with Christ or you have no worldview to stand upon in any way, shape, or form. And he may, he, he may, oh, let me finish this. He may be upset with me that I keep going back to saying, he says, well, how do you know that God is true? I said, because God says he said he's true. How do you know Jesus is Lord? Because Jesus said he is Lord. But that is the basis upon which I stand. I'm not going to take my feet off the Bible. Because the Bible says itself to be true. Therefore it is. And it's proven itself because it is totally consistent through and through. Even, even if this man and, and whoever else wants to object brings many, many accusations against it, the scriptures have proven themselves throughout history to be true. To be true. Well, sir, the, the Bible was written in three different languages Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, and Greek. And, the, like, for example, the translation I'm using right now. Well, what I was going to say was, uh, the translation I'm using right now is directly translated from the Greek and the Hebrew originally. Which version? I'm using the New American Standard. Okay, better than so, the King James. Uh, I mean, the New King. I mean, the King James version is very good. The New King James. It's missing four books. How do you rip four books out of an infallible book? Uh, the, are you sure that that's right, sir? Because I own. Catholic Bible. I'm not talking about the Catholic Bible. Yeah, well, Luther ripped four books out of it. Somehow it's still infallible. Well, that's not true, sir. Luther didn't remove chapters? No, sir. No, sir. No, he didn't. During the Protestant Reformation, we had uh, men like Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, or Zwingli, men like that, who said, let's go back and study history and see what the Jewish people considered to be Old Testament Scripture. What had happened was the Catholic Church had added extra books called the Apocrypha, which is, I think, 12 books, if I remember correctly. And the Protestant Reformers went back, studied history, and saw that the Jewish people did not accept those 12 books to be Scripture. So they said, we're not either. If it has not historically been accepted as, as scripture inspired by God, we're not going to believe church tradition. We're going to go back and stand upon what the Jewish people did. No, I believe that because the Bible says that. Because of who, because who is, sir? Lilith. Lilith? I'm not, a, I'm not familiar with any of that. I know that the I know that the King James and as well as New American Standard say uh, Eve. Got to go back into um, the big book of Jewish fairy tales. Uh, but Lilith was created from the clay, just like Adam, but uh, made to be subservient. She didn't like that. She didn't want to take the bottom position during sex, so she fled off with a bunch of demons. I think I, I I've never heard that before. I think you, you you may just be mistaken on that point. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. One of us is mistaken. Indeed, and I, I believe it's you. That's why I'm standing up here on the box. Now, and that's why I plead with you to come to Christ and live and have okay. eternal life. Now I'm higher. Now God says this. He does say this. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he's going to rip. Absolutely, indeed. That's why I'm out here sharing with you my opinion. But I believe that my opinion is more than my opinion. That it's objective truth. Because God has said it first. I'm nobody. I'm going to die one day. And guess what? I was born just like, what, 20 years ago. So guess what? God's truth was here before I was here, and it's going to be here after I'm gone. haven't addressed it lying about rabbits chewing the cud. Leviticus 11, 3 through 6. Leviticus 11, 3 through 6. The hair, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. That's no problem, because rabbits don't chew cud. Which verse is that, sir? 11, 3 through 6. Oh, you're, verse 6 there, the rabbit also. For though it chews cud, it does not divide the hoof, it doesn't clean to you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Damn. It's almost like an ancient man was watching rabbits and didn't know what he was seeing. So here's what's interesting. I can say this. 
I'm not exactly sure about this particular verse. I really don't know. But that book is inspired by the man, the deity that... So wait a second. Have. Because I may not understand a particular verse, no, no, the whole Bible, God. all 66 God. books, is now false. Yeah. Be if you're going to say that God cannot lie, God wrote that book, and God... I, I didn't say this as a lie. I said I, as an infallible man, I don't know. I haven't studied this verse. I haven't read commentary. Yeah. Uh, think about this, for Maybe example. Study some more before you come out here and start trying to influence people. Well, if I did that, guess what? I would never come out here because there's an infinite amount of things to study in Scripture. Jesus went out to the wilderness to pray or went off to the edge of the lake and the people followed him instead of going off into the middle of the city and making a scene. That's not true. He did that. In fact, that's yeah, why he, he ended up getting crucified. It's interesting. Jesus, it's interesting. People get offended when I, when people like myself come up and preach in the street. Did you get offended and it's interesting. any other religion came out here and Oh, I'm not offended. I'm actually grateful that you're standing up for your opinion. But So I can show that your worldview is false and that Jesus is the truth. I'm grateful that you're here, sir. Look at all these people standing around now because you stood up. Yeah. See, what you meant for evil, God has meant for good. Now listen, friends. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through Christ. And this man may, may not believe that, but it is true. It's objectively true. It's not true. It is true. It is very much truth. It is, and this man's bothered. It annoys him. He couldn't have walked by. He had to stand up and voice his opinion. And do you know why? Do you know why it bothered this man? Not because the Bible's inconsistent. That's not what bothered him. It, it did not bother him that this man. It, what? This man was not bothered because the Bible's inconsistent. This man's bothered because he has sinned against the Holy God, and because he knows he sinned against the Holy God. And because you, I and all of you know by default that we've sinned against an infinitely holy God. Everyone around here believes the same as you. That's pretty No, our conscience testifies to the fact that we are morally sinners in the hands of an angry God. That we are accountable to God for our sin against Him. And so this man is angry at God. Why? Why is he angry at God? Or why is he upset? Why is he disagreeing? Because he has sin. And his sin can be forgiven because of what Christ has done. Your sin can be removed because of Christ's finished work. The heart of stone can be removed and you can be given a heart of flesh. Jesus Christ saves from hatred. Hatred of fellow man. Jesus Christ saves from slavery to sexual immorality as well. Jesus Christ and his father actually had rules on who you could own as a slave. My friends, Jesus Christ... Come, has come to set the captives free. Those who are slaves to sin. It's interesting. Because we know Paul says in Romans chapter 1. It's interesting. Paul says in Romans 1. He says, I am a doulos of Christ. The word doulos means slave. Bond servant. And it's interesting that when you become the slave of Jesus Christ. You're the most free that you could possibly ever be. What an interesting dichotomy. An interesting dynamic. That when one is the slave of Christ. They are as free as they could possibly be. As free as a man could be. I think about the reformers, those men I mentioned earlier, Luther, John Calvin, or Zwingli, or a man by the name of John Rogers, who was burned at the stake in front of his wife and ten children for believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They said that as he was being led off to the stake to be burned, that he was so joyful and so happy, and his church followed him out there. His congregants were happy, and they said that it was like he was going to a wedding ceremony because he was going to enter heaven. And friends... That is what the truth of the gospel does. It changes men so that when they stare at death itself, they say, oh death, where is thy sting? Oh death, where is thy victory? The wicked, the wicked, the wicked do not die easy. Sir, you're not going to die easy if you continue on in your sin. Death is a horrible thing for the wicked. I do dying in combat. I do not wish to age and wither into ancient eating like you. Friends, Friends, death is not an easy thing if you are the wicked. I'll find a bridge and guard it until a worthy opponent can lay me down and I can find my old father in Valhalla. Death is not a joke, my friends. It is real. Hey, guess what? Here's a statistic. I asked these girls one time on the street uh, about two months ago. I was out here. And I said, how many, how many people do you think die every day? And they both guessed. One said 1,000 and one said 6,000. And I told them it's 150,000 people die every single day across the world. And that, that's just, there, there's more than that. I've heard, I've seen estimates to 160,000. Friends, death could come upon you and you not know it. You who are young like me and think you're all that in a bag of chips. Friends, our, our vitality, our youthfulness can be stripped from us. Pay a bill again. From, by God's providence. It's not a joke, sir. When you die, you stand before God. You know what scripture says? You know what scripture says about those who mock God? I not see your God when I die. 
You certainly will. No, I won't. I'll see my gods. You will not. Yeah, I will. And that's why I'm out here, sir, because I care. I do care for you. Though I set myself up as someone who disagrees with you, and I certainly do, and you disagree with me, I care for you. I care for you, too. That you yourself not perish. That you not perish in your sins. Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to him, them in His anger and terrify them in His fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my King upon Zion, my holy mountain. And that's Christ. Jesus sits at the right hand of the majesty on high and He reigns as King, as the King of glory, as the Lord of righteousness. And all who try to rebel against Him will only see the wrath of God. But friends, God has shown grace. God has shown, shown grace towards sinful men in that He would send His Son to bear His wrath. It's not that Jesus was beat up by some bad guys and nailed to a tree. It was that Christ upon the cross bore the holy wrath of God against sin. Against the sin of God's people. Just as I read that text earlier in Romans 4, God raises the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. This God who is spoken of in Scripture is infinitely holy and powerful and wonderful, awe-inspiring. Even we know from 1 John, God is love. God Himself is love. It's interesting, the Scripture says, love never fails. What love is that? Is it some pseudo-love or the love that is spoken of in our culture? No, it is the love of God for His people. And the love that they have in their hearts for Him and for His truth, for His Christ. As I mentioned earlier, God is a consuming fire. A jealous God. What is He jealous for? He's jealous for justice. Jealous for His own glory. Let us not think of God as merely all about man. He made man for Himself. We are not made to our own end for ourselves. Rather, we are made for His glory. And my friends, God has given His law. His Ten Commandments. You've heard of the Ten Commandments if you have some sort of religious background, some sort of Judeo-Christian background. You've probably heard of God's Ten Commandments. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not blaspheme. Those are given in Exodus 20 and repeated often in the New Testament. Friends, you and I have broken those commands, have broken those laws that God gave. We are liars, thieves and blasphemers. We are by default adulterers. And it's interesting, even the secret sins God sees, even the things that are inside the heart, God sees them. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that when a man looks at a woman with lust for her, that he already commits adultery with her in his heart. Or Jesus says there also that if you are angry with your brother, you've committed murder already. Why is that? Because God looks at the heart, friends. God's perfect standard applies to our very inward being, the inward man. And we cannot live up to that perfect standard of morality, of righteousness. That's because Adam, the first man, the federal head of the human race, sinned in the garden and all mankind sinned in him we fell in him and so you and me whether black or white rich or poor we were born in this state of sin we were born with this bent to be sinners to do that which is wrong it's interesting our parents didn't have to teach us to do that which is wrong rather what they taught us to do that which is right because our our inborn desire was already for that which was ungodly and friends because of this because of this law breaking, we deserve hell for our sins. We deserve the wrath of God to be poured out on us. See, that's what hell is. Hell's not a place where the devil has a pitchfork poking people in the back. What is hell? Hell is a place where God unleashes His holy justice. A, a holy God unleashes holy justice. Jesus speaks of this in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 25. In verse 46, He says, these, speaking of the wicked, will go away into eternal punishment. 
That's the most fearful part about hell, that it never ends. It continues on and on and on. It never ends because God's holiness is infinite. Just as God's love and mercy and grace are, so is God's justice and His righteousness. The psalmist says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. So what shall we do to escape this plight? What shall we do to escape this horrible sentence that is over our heads? What shall we do to escape the very fires of hell itself? That's where God's mercy and grace come in. And it's interesting, God's justice and God's grace are not opposing forces. God is not schizophrenic. Rather, God's attributes are in glorious harmony with one another. And so when we see that He saves people, it's not because His grace then throws out His judgment, His justice, or His love throws His righteousness away. It is rather that they stand in harmony with one another. In fact, Scripture speaks of this as grace and mercy, or grace and justice kiss. They come together in beautiful matrimony. They come together and they're met. They're married one unto another. And that mercy of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the very radiance of the glory of God. Jesus was sent into the world 2,000 years ago for a very specific purpose. And it was not to make our lives easier. It was not to give us health, wealth, and prosperity. Rather, it was to save sinners. Jesus was born of a virgin. And He lived under God's law, the law of which I just spoke, and fulfilled it. He obeyed God's law. So when it says, you shall not lie, and we see ourselves as liars, and when it says, you shall not steal, and we see that we are thieves, or it says, you shall not disobey or dishonor your parents, and we see we've done that, Christ, all of those things did He fulfill. He never lied, never stole. He never looked upon a woman with lust. He never was deceitful. Rather, He Himself is the truth. And He Himself fulfilled God's law perfectly. And then He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God. And He bore the wrath of God against the sins of His people. Upon the cross, Jesus Christ died as the Lamb of God. He died as the Lamb of God who died for the sins of His own people. God bless you, sir. Hey, where's, where's New Zealand? He's, he's not out here this evening. I have to keep preaching, though. It's great to see you. God bless you. I'd love to speak with you when I'm done, all right? I got so many people here wanting to listen. But maybe they want to listen to both of us. I'd like to, but I'll talk with you when I'm done. I would. I'll talk to you when I'm done. I want to read to you a passage of scripture that speaks of Jesus' sufferings upon the cross. And what is so incredible about this passage of scripture is that it was written seven centuries before Jesus was born. Seven centuries. Listen to what it says. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, to put him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Listen to the result of this. Verse 11, As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. My friends, Christ upon the cross bore the justice of God. He bore the wrath of God so that sinners would not suffer in hell. See, Jesus drank hell for his people. Paul tells the men at Ephesus in Ephesians 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. You husbands, you love your wife? Jesus Christ loved His church with a love that is so much greater than your love for your wife that it, it compelled Him to give His life up as a ransom for many. So he could say on the cross to Telestai, one word in Aramaic, which is translated, it is finished, it is complete. 
the debt that man has before God, the, the debt that we have before God is erased, not because God has now thrown His justice to the side, not because God has now thrown His righteousness away into the sea, but He has taken our sins and balled them up and drowned them in the sea of Christ's blood. That's why. Because Jesus' blood was shed. See, the Bible, when it speaks of the blood of Christ, means the life of Christ. See, in the Old Testament, God says the life of the animals in its blood. When the, when the animals in the Old Testament were killed and the blood was drained, that was simply a symbol of something that was happening. That the life of the animal was being required rather than the sinner's life. So it is with Jesus Christ. It's not that the blood has some sort of efficacy as a physical object or a physical substance. Rather, it's, it's symbolic that Jesus' life was drained out of His very body and the wrath of God was appeased. And Jesus was raised on the third day. Jesus was raised from the dead. This man may want to naysay, and he may want to stand against that reality, but Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is more alive than you and I. He is more alive than you could possibly fathom. He rose from the dead. In fact, such power was manifested in, the, the, in Christ being raised from the dead that it says in the Scripture that many graves of righteous people burst open and they walked out when Jesus was raised from the dead. Forty days later, Christ bodily ascended up from the top of the Mount of Olives into heaven. And He sat down at God's right hand in heaven. He sat down. Hebrews 1.3 says, And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. Jesus, the great High Priest, the High Priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, sat down because His work was complete, unlike those Old Testament priests who continually entered the, the temple time and time again to continue to offer up animal sacrifices which could not remove sin. But Christ enters as High Priest forever, and He offers Himself once for all and purchases redemption. So friends, now comes the imperative. Now comes the application of this truth. You must repent and believe. My friend who is just standing up here trying to heckle the preaching of the gospel, he must repent and believe. Repentance is simply turning from sin. Turning from sin and turning unto God. And belief, faith, is placing one's confidence in God in what God has said to be true. When God says, I will forgive your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. We believe that because God Himself has said it. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Dear friends, I call you that because I care for you. I may not know you personally, but listen to me. Don't lose your soul for your sins. I'm young, yes, but I have committed sins in my life for which I am greatly ashamed. And I regret it all. But I do not regret giving up a single thing for Christ. And I've lost much for Him, but He is worth it all. Friends, your sins will taste bitter one day. They taste bitter, or they taste sweet right now. But they will be bitter. They will be so bitter one day. Spit them out of your mouth now. Let them go. Taste and see that the Lord is good. To continue with the analogy that just happened to come out. Taste and see that the Lord is good, my friends. He is great and ab abounding in loving kindness and truth. And so if you repent and believe the gospel, here's what will happen. The moment you repent and believe, which is something you cannot even do unless God grants it to you. But if you repent and believe upon Christ, God forgives you of sin. All sin, past, present, future, because of Christ, because of Jesus' death upon the cross. And then He wraps you in the righteousness of Christ. He looks upon you as if you lived Jesus' life because He looked upon Christ as if He lived yours. That's the exchange. Jesus takes my sin and I get His righteousness. What a deal. What a deal. It cost us nothing. And He emptied Himself 
Christ became rich. Or Christ became poor. He who was rich emptied his accounts. He who was rich became poor for us so that we might become rich. Not the way Creflo Dollar and Joel Osteen talk about it. I'm talking about spiritual riches. Not like those goofball morons on television. And I say that not as an insult necessarily, but as an accurate description of their intellect. They're moronic. Those preachers on television are moronic. My friends, Jesus came to give us spiritual riches. Spiritual riches. And if you are wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, then you are, you are so spiritually rich. You are saved if you are wrapped in the righteousness of Christ and you are given entrance to God's kingdom. And you will be like the thief on the cross. It's amazing. Think about it. The thief on the cross, his hands were pinned to a tree. What could the man do? He could not do any baptism or any washings. He could not help himself. He was tied to a cross, but he looked. He looked to the Son of God. He looked to Jesus Christ and he said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And what did he say? Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what you must do, friends. Abandon your self-righteousness. Abandon trying to obtain favor in the sight of God by your own religious works, by your own morality, by your own church attendance or prayers. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Nor uh, my zeal no rest, could my zeal no respite, no. Could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. As the old hymn puts it, no works of the law will justify us, friends. No amount of religiosity can amend you to God. It is the only, only thing that can save you is the work of Jesus Christ. It is all by grace. And those who are saved are given new hearts, new desires. See, there are many of you out here tonight who say you're Christian. I, was, I, I said I was a Christian for eight years before I be, truly became born again. You can say up and down that you believe in Jesus. Just about everyone does here in the South. We're in the midst of the Bible Belt. Everybody claims Jesus Christ is their Savior. Everybody's been, everybody's done did that. Everybody's been born again. Everybody said the prayer. They walked the aisle. And some preacher out in the country told them that they're Christian. But listen, friends, the mark of a true Christian, the mark of, true, of a true Christian is not just that they say that they know Christ. It's that Christ has changed their life. See, I said I was a Christian for eight years, but I had no life change. My life was not different from anyone else. I lived just as I did before. In fact, I became more sinful. Addicted to pornography and I was a drunkard and worldly and perverted and evil and cursed like a sailor and blasting God's most precious holy name. And then God saved me. And I was changed. I wasn't changed because I thought, now I've got to stop doing all those things I once liked to do and I've got to do the things I hate because i just got to buckle down and be a religious man so I can go to heaven. That's a lost man's religion that will only get you to hell. True religion is when God takes a man and changes his heart. See, God is out to change people's hearts. The gospel is about inward change. And guess what that inward change does? It changes the man outwardly. That's why I say, if there is no outward change in your life, then you're not fooling anybody. You might be fooling yourself, friends, but listen. I say this because I love you. You're, dis you're self-deluded if you're in such a state. And I plead with you to renounce a false, that false profession of faith and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And this gospel is not only for those who are lost, for those who are found. I meditate upon the gospel daily because it is my sustenance, it's my strength. It is a daily gospel. Paul says in Romans, in Romans 1, that he wants to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome and they were Christians for their encouragement. It is all by God's grace. All by God's grace and it is to one end. To one end, my friends. And that is the glory of God. Ultimately, we are saved for our good, yes. For our eternal good. But ultimately for this. For the glory of God. For God's own praise and honor. 
bless you. God bless you guys. Thank you so Good much. Night. That's the end to which we are saved. God's glory. That's why you and I have been created. It's glorious not living for myself. It's glorious knowing I'm living for something greater than me. For God. For God. For His glory. That's why we've been created. That's why this man's been created. That's why this man has been created. That's why the stars are set in their place. And that's why the sun rises every morning and sets every evening. That's why the wind blows to and fro upon the earth. That's why the seasons come and go. For God's glory. What does it say in Psalm 19? The heavens are declaring the glory of God. All creation screams. It pre preaches to you and me concerning God's glory. Paul says in Romans 11, I love this passage, Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became His counselor or who has first given to Him that it, may be paid, it might be paid back to Him again. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen and amen. In closing, I will say these brief words. Friends, if you know not of the love of Jesus Christ, then I plead with you, I beg of you to come. To come to Christ and live. Have life eternal. I beg you. If you say you know Christ, examine yourself. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith to see whether your profession holds up under the scrutiny of the Word of God. And if you know not Christ, to repent, to turn from sin and to turn to the living God. And if you're a believer, rejoice! Rejoice in the Lord always! Paul says to always rejoice. Why? Because we have treasure in heaven. I've lost, I've lost things in this life, friends. I've experienced heartache in this life. But listen, my treasure's not here. My treasure's not here. It's all going to burn. It's all going to go to dust. My treasure's in heaven where Jesus Christ abides. He is my treasure. He Himself. So to conclude, to go back all the way to Romans 4, where we began. Now Paul says there that Abraham believed God because of God's character. Because God raises the dead. <coughs> Excuse me. And calls into being that which does not exist. So can we also believe upon God who has so proven Himself to be trustworthy. And we've seen that though we are sinners, Jesus Christ is a great Savior. That though we've broken God's law, and we deserve to go unto hell. That Jesus bears God's wrath upon His own shoulders on the cross. And is raised on the third day. And the promise is that all who believe this are saved eternally. Forgiven of their sins. Wrapped in His righteousness. All by His grace. All by His grace. Grace, we could turn it into an, an, an acronym if we wanted to. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Think about that. We get all the riches that God gives to a man and it is put to Christ's account. Christ takes the bill as it were. He's already taken it and paid for it, purchased it with the shed, by the shedding of His own blood. It is all to Christ's glory. I'll read one more passage and then I'll close it out. In 2 Peter. 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness but grow in the grace and knowledge 
Oh, God bless you, sir. Thank you so much. God bless you. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, sir. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And with that we say, Amen.